Hi everyone, my name is Jelly Bean. I'm a student nurse and today I'm going to demonstrate to you the enema procedure. Enema is the installation of solution in the rectum and sigmoid colon. There are six purposes of this procedure. First is to promote desiccation by stimulating peristalsis. Second is it is a vehicle for drug that exerts a local effect on the rectal mucosa. Third is it is used as a temporary relief for constipation. Fourth is it is used in the removal of impacted mass. Fifth is it is used to empty the bowel before diagnostic tests, surgeries, or childbirth. And lastly, it is used in beginning a program in bowel training. The materials that we need for enema procedure are the following. We need our bath blanket. We need our rubber pad or the bed protector. We need our bed pan or commode. We need our tissue paper. Clean gloves, pre-packed enema or fleet enema, tissue paper, soap, water, water-soluble lubricant, and our washcloth. And of course, we are going to need our stethoscope as well later for the procedure. In the assessment, the very first thing we have to assess is the presence of any bowel disorders such as diverticulitis, ulcerative colitis, abdominal pain, abdominal distension, hemorrhoids, or recent bowel surgery. These conditions will actually put the patient at risk for complications such as perforation or mucosal irritation. The next thing we have to do is to inspect the abdomen of our patient. Inspecting the abdomen is very necessary to have a baseline of the effectivity of our enema. And there are four ways that we could inspect our patient's abdomen. The very first one is our inspection. In inspection, we use our senses. We would need our eyes, our ears, our nose in inspecting. And in the inspection, we generally observe the general contour of the patient's abdomen. We have to take note of presence of any scars, marks, lesions, veins, masses such as hernia or hematoma. And also, we have to observe the abdomen of our patient as he or she would breathe if it is symmetrical. Another way of assessing our patient's abdomen is through auscultation. In auscultating, we have to use our stethoscope. So we have to place the diaphragm over the abdomen of our patient and to listen for the bowel sounds. The normal bowel sound ranges from 5 to 35 bowel sounds per minute. If it's less than 5, it could suggest hypoactivity. And if it's more than 35, it could suggest hyperactivity, which both suggest, you know, both situations would suggest that there is a problem. So another thing is we have to listen for brutes or the swishing sound. It could also suggest a problem. Aside from auscultating, another way is percussing our patient's abdomen. To percuss, you have to use your non-dominant hand, and in my case, it would be my right hand. You can flex it, and using the distal part of our middle finger, we can percuss it with the dominant hand. Okay, so um, percuss, and listen to the sound or any abnormalities. Now, there are two kinds of percussion. We have the direct percussion and the indirect percussion. What I showed you earlier is the indirect percussion. Now, for the direct percussion, we simply use the tip of our fingers and to tap it directly. So, this method is basically used when assessing the sinuses of our clients. Now, aside from percussion, the last way is through palpation. There are two kinds of palpation. We have the light palpation and deep palpation. Light palpation will reveal surface abnormalities. So, as we palpate lightly, we have to depress the patient's abdomen at about one half to three fourth inch. Okay, and as we lightly palpate, we have to note for texture, tenderness, mobility, and even temperature and elasticity of the skin. Meanwhile, deep palpation will allow us to palpate the internal organs. So by deeply palpating or depressing the skin at about one and one half inch to two inches, we can actually palpate the internal organs of our patient in the abdomen area. We have to note for masses, tenderness, 
mobility, and symmetry. After inspecting the patient's abdomen, the next thing to do is to review our patient's chart for any conditions that may contraindicate with the procedure, such as glaucoma, recent rectal or prostate surgery, and increased intracranial pressure. These conditions are actually contraindicated to the procedure. So if your patient has any of this, you have to notify the physician whether to proceed with the procedure or not. Okay, so then we can now note our patient's last bowel movement, bowel pattern, and bowel sound. This will establish a baseline for the bowel function. Still part of the assessment is to check the physician's order and patient care plan. Checking the physician's order will allow us to verify the need for enema and also for legality purposes. Another thing that we have to include in the assessment is to assess our patient's cognitive level and mobility status. Assessing the cognitive level will let us know the patient's ability to follow instructions. Assessing the mobility will let us know if there is a need to put our patient on a bad hand. To assess the patient's cognitive level, we can ask questions such as what did he or she eat at lunch or breakfast or what date is it today or even you could ask him which town did he come from. So. Those kind of questions will, will give us a hint as to the patient's cognitive level. For the mobility status, you could ask the patient whether he or she is able to go to the bathroom on his own or does he need assistance. Still part of our assessment is to wash our hands for infection control. Now that we have washed our hands thoroughly, we may now assemble and gather all the equipment that we would be needing in this procedure. Open the enema kit, attach a tube to the container can if you're using a can enema. After that, close or clamp the tube and fill the can with lukewarm water, 500 ml to 1000 ml of solution. We are using lukewarm here because using cold water can cause abdominal cramps and using very hot water can cause irritation to the mucosa lining. The temperature of the solution should range from 105 degrees Fahrenheit to 110 degrees Fahrenheit. Infants could tolerate 50 to 150 ml of solution, while toddlers could tolerate 250 to 350 ml of water. For school age, they could tolerate 300 to 500 ml of water. That basically ends our assessment. We may now proceed with our implementation. For implementation, the very first thing we have to do is to identify the correct patient and explain the procedure to the patient. Identifying the patient will let us know that we are doing the procedure to the correct patient and explaining the procedure to the client will alleviate his or her anxiety. Good morning sir, my name is Jolodine. I'll be your nurse for today. May I know your complete name and birth date? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, thank you. May I check your wristband? Alright. Okay, thank you. Mr. Red, today your doctor has ordered to give you an enema. Enema is a procedure wherein we are going to put this solution inside your rectal area to help you alleviate the constipation that you are feeling. The procedure will be a little bit uncomfortable, but deep breathing through the mouth could greatly help us. In this procedure, you may feel abdominal cramps and I need you to hold the solution for as long as you can inside your rectal area. In this procedure, you are going to feel a strong urge to go to the toilet. So, sir, are you able to go to the restroom on your own or uh, do you need other people's assistance perhaps? Okay, so you are able. That's good. You could use the toilet later. However, please don't flush since I still have to assess the expelled solution. So, we would know if we would need additional enema, okay? Alright, then that's good. After explaining the procedure to the patient, make sure to provide privacy by using the curtains around or closing the door to the room. This will provide privacy to our patient and help the patient alleviate his anxiety towards the procedure. After providing privacy, we may now raise the level of the bed into a working height. This procedure will actually allow the nurse to work with ease and avoid back pains during the procedure. After doing that, we may now put the rubber pad or the bed protector under the patient. Now, doing so will allow us to protect the linen from getting soiled. So, I'm going to insert the uh, bed protector underneath you, okay? Here we go. 
Okay. After putting the rubber pad, we may now hang the anima can on the ivy pole if you're using the anima can. Now, while you are holding the tip of the tube over the waist receptacle, which is connected, basically the tube is connected to the can, let's open or unclamp the clamp on the tube to let the solution flow from the can all the way to the tube. This procedure is priming the tube, which is basically removing the air that might cause this tension and discomfort if introduced in the bowel of our patient. Once the tube is completely filled in, we can now close or reclamp the tube. Okay. After the priming is done, the next thing to do is to put our patient on the left side seams position with the right knee flex. Putting the patient on this position will allow the solution to flow downward by gravity and also this position will allow us to follow the normal curvature of our sigmoid colon and rectum. That's improving the retention of the solution. Sir, I'm going to put you on your left side with your right knee slightly flexed, okay? All right, slowly, easy. Here we go. All right. Now that we have placed our patient on the left side seams position with right knee flex, the next thing to do is to cover or drape our patient with our bath blanket, exposing only the buttocks area or the rectal area. This will provide privacy to our patient. may remove the top sheet of our patient. To expose the buttocks area or the rectal area, we can use the diamond technique of folding. That way we could still preserve the patient's privacy and not expose too much skin of our patient. After draping the patient and exposing only the buttocks and rectal area, the next thing to do is to don gloves. Donning gloves will prevent the transmission of bacteria or microorganisms and it is used for infection control. The next thing to do is to lubricate the tip of our tube using a water-soluble lubricant if necessary because most of the rectal tubes are already lubricated. Now, lubricating it with a water-soluble lubricant will actually reduce the friction and will avoid damaging the rectal mucosa of our patient. Now, since in this procedure we will be using a fleet enema, then there is no need for us to do that. The next thing to do is to gently lift the buttocks of our patient and to locate the rectal area. Tell the patient to breathe slowly through the mouth as it will relax the external rectal sphincter. Sir, please breathe in slowly using your mouth. Just take deep breaths using your mouth and relax. Now that you have located the rectal area of our patient, insert our tube gently in a circular motion because the anal area is very sensitive. So we have to be very gentle and point the tip of the tube towards the umbilicus of our patient since that will follow the natural curvature of the sigmoid colon and the rectum. So in insertion as well, the reason why we have to do it gently and slowly is to avoid traumatizing the rectal area or the rectal mucosa in case that the tube might be lodged against the rectal wall. Now, we also have to observe proper insertion. There is a certain distance that we could insert the tube. For adults, we have to insert it between 3 to 4 inches, while for a child, we may insert it from 2 to 3 inches. For infants, we may insert it from 1 to 1.5 inches. If we insert it beyond the proper control limit, we may cause bowel perforation and we don't want that to happen. Okay, so gently and circular motion. There you go. 
During low enemas, we may hang and hold the enema can at about 12 inches above the rectal area. For high enemas, we may hang and hold the enema can in no more than 18 inches. The reason is that the higher that we hang and hold the can is the faster the flow of the solution, thus the greater the pressure on the rectum. Now that the tube is in, we may now slowly administer the enema solution or squeeze the enema can gently to empty the entire hypertonic solution. Now, most solution contains 250 cc approximately. The reason that we are administering the enema solution slowly is we are basically decreasing the chance or the likelihood of intestinal cramps. And also remember that we have to instill the enema further in order to clean the entire bowel. Now that the total volume of solution has been instilled, by using our toilet paper, we can wrap this around the tube, especially if the tube is soiled with fecal matter. So to avoid the transmission of bacteria or microorganism, wrap it around until it can be completely rinsed off or disposed. After that, we have to provide privacy to the patient, cover the patient, and assist the patient to a comfortable position. And again, remind the patient to retain the solution as much as he can. Sir, I'll guide you now to a comfortable position. Now, if you do feel the urge to defecate, please hold it for as long as you can. And, and if you cannot hold it anymore, then that's the time that we are going to let you go to the restroom. If the patient is ready to expel the solution, we may now elevate the head of the bed to assume a squatting position. This position will facilitate the act of defecation. If the patient is able, the patient may use the restroom as previously mentioned, but instruct or remind the patient never to flush since we have to assess the expelled solution. Mr. Red, if you do feel the urge to use a restroom and expel the solution and you can't hold it anymore, please do not flush because we still have to assess the expelled solution if there's a need for additional enema, okay? Alright, thank you. We have to remember to provide privacy for the entire time that the patient is expelling the instilled solution. That will alleviate our patient's anxiety during the procedure. Once a patient is done expelling the solution, we have to assist the patient for perennial care. The next thing to do is to assist our patient to a comfortable position. That will make the patient comfortable and alleviate his or her anxiety. Now, after that, don't forget to measure the returns if the patient is under a strict intake and output monitoring. We have to dispose the equipments or materials that we have used, especially the soiled ones. That will prevent the spread of bacteria, microorganisms, and for infection control as well. We may now remove our gloves and dispose we may now dispose our gloves and wash our hands. In case that our gloves has been soiled earlier from fecal matter, then don't hesitate to change it to avoid the transmission of bacteria. After doing that, we may now return to our patient and do an aftercare. Of course, we have to remove the bath blanket and put back the top sheet of our patient. That basically ends our implementation. We may now proceed with our evaluation. For evaluation, we have to observe and evaluate the results, such as we have to observe our patient's response during the enema procedure, we have to note our patient's skin color, respiratory rate, pulse rate may also be obtained before and after the procedure. We also have to watch out for signs of excessive fatigue in the patient. Next is to observe the amount, the color, and consistency of the stool. Next thing is we have to evaluate our patient's tolerance during the procedure. Was there any cramping, or discomfort. Next is we have to examine the returns for presence of stool or any particles. For the documentation, we have to document the type of enema used, whether it's can enema or okay, we have to document that all on our nurse's notes. For pre-pack enema, we may have to document it as well on our MAR or medication administration record. And lastly, we have to document our patient's tolerance our response during the procedure. And that would be all. Thank you so much.